My name is Marish Banak, and today I'm going to be speaking about desperate infection chains. And just a tiny little dime about me. I'm a retimer myself, and I also probably might be a little bit known by my uh, GitHub activity, as well as uh, my, my inclination towards the sole idea of initial access. I just like to breach, and then I get bored afterwards. So um, today I'm going to be speaking about, um, about the, the notion and the emerging threat, the newly, uh, newly observed threat among the threat actors, being so-called um, complex infection chain, something that I, I, I keep on dubbing, uh, and the idea behind it. I'll, I would like to propose some kind of a formalized taxonomy for naming uh, the subsequent steps of, the, of, of such a chained uh, delivery, and then discuss uh, what techniques, what vectors are there that could constitute such a chain. So, um, in today's agenda, we're going to be uh, we're going to be discussing um, a little bit about consigned threats. Then we're going to be focusing on complex infection chains, and then just a tiny little um, addition on the unusual vectors that are worth our time for noting. So, um, if you are in this business for a little longer while, you're probably um, already aware. You probably have this kind of recollections where you just jumped into the Metasploit framework, and then you just used some kind of a encode and payload to just grab yourself a nice reverse TCP executable. And then once having executable, you would just go write for the email, attach it to the mail, then send it to the entire organization. And then you'll be getting, getting like multiple shells coming back within a minute, right? They used to be the times, golden times. But now these times, nowadays, it's not so simple. Uh, probably these days we need to um, far more, um, we need to implement far more um, precautions and steps to us getting the properly chained, um, chained delivery. So stuff like using um, HTML smuggling to just deliver a file to the organization to get, back, to get passed through the, um, to the stringent and proxy policies that tend to limit what kind of file formats can we actually um, deliver to the, to the organization. Then we're going to be looking for some kind of a container to just bundle all the files all together in, in a one single file and then some kind of a um, triggering vector that, that when double-clicked would initiate the entire infection chain. So let's, um, let's just postpone this concept for a moment and let us uh, head uh, into introduction and code science instead. Um, this is what we, what we are facing today, like complex infection chains. By the complex, we mean multiple steps chained all together, um, um, guiding the victim step by step to the actual, to the to the ultimate blow being uh, being the constitution of the reverse action, uh, reverse access for the adversary, and that would give him an access to the organization behind the perimeter. And you probably might already seen this kind of a um, funny pictures scattered around the Twitter uh, when we keep on observing the the same old boring vectors when the threat actors keep on sending PDFs. They will be containing links. The links will be then pointing towards some, some website. They will be then delivering ISO. Within the ISO is going to be um, some kind of a VB script or J script. And this is kind of a, uh, for me, it sounds really desperately. And, it's, and, and it indicates that threat actors, especially those lesser capable, are struggling so hard to get past the currently uh, implemented countermeasures, such as mark of the web flag, uh, the smart screen, WDAC. So it really, it, it really indicates that um, it is getting so much harder for, for, for the lesser capable groups to actually breach the perimeters. So it means that, the actually, uh, that, that, that um, all, the, all the recommendations, all the countermeasures that the, both vendors and consultants were recommending throughout the years are actually starting paying dividends. But let's just postpone this for a moment and let's discuss a kind of a newish a newish problem of code signed threads. So, there are multiple files that can get code signed, that, can, that we can use the code signing certificate and sign the, these files uh, indicating that they come from the trusted and legitimate um, entity. So, among the others, we can have executables, clearly, scripts, installers, but also office macros and drivers, click once deployments, and even cabinets can be, can be digitally signed. Now, what are the, um, what are the uh, 
like um, outcomes of signing, for instance, the cabinet, this is, is still a field worth exploring and still field worth, uh, worth testing out. What would be the response from typical systems that you have installed on your, on your endpoints? Systems such as smart screen, maybe your own EDRs, how would they react for, uh, for scanning through or just opening a digitally signed file? Now, when it comes to, to digitally signed threads and malware, we've, we can have a few states, uh, we can have a few different kinds of digitally signed malware. Clearly, we can have a malware that was signed with, a, an, with an already expired certificate. There will, be the, um, there will be the view of it. Then the certificate might also be still valid, but nonetheless revoked because the vendor is already aware that his certificate got leaked in some way. So he tries to maintain the, the damage contain it in some way by revoking it. And then also we can have the valid one. So um, this is just the example of, of me signing Mimikatz using the leaked MSI certificate that, um, that was somewhat, uh, somewhat on the, on the media, media news coverage a few weeks ago, a few days ago. Okay, so now what do you find, how do you can, uh, how can you get, um, how can you find, sorry, uh, certificates yourself? So certificates tend to get stolen, right? Uh, we know the drill. Uh, MediaTek, MSI, Netgear, NVIDIA. Sorry if you hear that, but these, um, these um, large companies got actually breached at once at least, or possibly some of their employees got breached, and these employees might happen to have a code signing certificate along with entire source code uh, somewhere lying on their, on their endpoints, on their machines, on their laptops. And then it only takes um, a little bit of, of effort to steal such a source code repository, upload it to some dark net or some Tor, Tor protected servers, and then offer it to the world by just spreading havoc and damage, right? So this is, uh, this is how the uh, MSI, MSI big, big, huge leak um, looked like a few days ago, a few, few, maybe a few, uh, few months, a few weeks ago, sorry. They also, well, they also get leaked and can be found on other publicly available stores, like, for instance, public cloud storages, as well as, well, just very well-known code repositories, right? Um, so by just going for any kind of software that tends to look around and then just scrap around um, the cloud S3 buckets, maybe blob storages, we might be able to find all these juicy PFXs and other certificates, and then once having one, it only boils down to cracking the password, which typically tends to get not longer than a few characters long. Typically, there's this going to be like four characters or so, according to uh, at least the certificates I've seen leaked. And also, we can, we can even abuse the uh, GitHub's, uh, GitHub's built-in searching engine by just looking for the regular expression um, searching for the prefixes, and then out of the sudden you'll see and you'll notice that there are more than 3,000 3, files already out there that will be actually matching the filter. And this, is sometimes, this sometimes can lead to disclosing someone else's either private or company um, code signing certificate because the developer probably just forgot to exclude it in his git ignore. Certificates also get to leaked and can be found on some shady and kind of a fishy forums. Like here we can see unknown cheats. The unknown cheats is a gold mine for leaked certificates. If you go and you, if, if you register there and you just take a look at, at pro, and, and, and a bunch of, bunch of forums, you'll see that there is a constant influx of leaked certificates coming from, you, you cannot even tell from where do they get there. So, some, uh, some forums are already spreading the, spreading the certificates uh, to satisfy their own goals. Like, for instance, the game hacking community um, tends to await for the certificate to grab it while it's hot and then sign their own, um, their own custom written um, kernel, kernel drivers that would then try to combat anti-cheating uh, anti systems such as Valorant, maybe, or, or uh, easy anti-cheat. So these folks are already out there and looking for the certificates long before we were looking for them. And if you happen to be in this industry long ago, uh, for a long while, you also can recall the, the very, uh, very close to my heart, Kellner Mold Info, where this kind of information was, was also 
uh, pretty heavily shared. So this is what I'm, what, what I'm talking about. Um, what's the difference uh, when, when somebody asks for, hey, but this certificate seems to be expired, so is it, any, is it even useful anymore? And then somebody would, some, some more experienced game, hack, game hacking a distinguished member would then come and say then, hey, what's the difference? Um, not, not, so, not so many vendors are actually checking for the expiration time of the certificate, so why bothering about it? Then also, certificates tend to get cracked or collided, like we've used to see in the 2012 when the flame came out, and the flame used to collide the MD5 to just try to um, impersonate somebody else's certificate. So, um, so the so the um, so the threat is quite real and is quite um, quite visible. Sometimes some some scanners, some ideas, and some um, and some products might be vulnerable, might be susceptible to um, to assuming that the file is going to be legitimate solely based on presence of any kind of a certificate that it might be having. Like this is one of the case. Um, this may be a laughable result, right? Only eight products were outruled by the sole presence of self-signed, but, but this kind of indicates the intuition that, hey, there are some checks that might be falling into this if statement. If there is a certificate, then conclude this is a good file. This might be a good file. Some products might be cutting corners here and might not be doing the, uh, performing the due diligence to actually check and verify whether the certificate checks out. Another example, uh, the one that was probably discovered by Wilderman, if I'm, if I'm correct, was uh, the idea to, to self-sign the Visual Basic script and then just to try to download it from the internet. Then the typically, um, this script will be having Mark of the Web uh, flag applied on it, right? And then, in a normal circumstances, smart screen should be complaining that, hey, first of all, this file came from the untrusted origin because it's having Mark of the Web. Secondly, it doesn't have a valid certificate on it, so I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be displaying the user this nasty NAC screen and telling him that, hey, don't run this script, right? But in this case, since the certificate was actually there, but it was actually, it was self-signed one, it was enough for the smart screen to conclude that this file can be somewhat legitimate because it is having the certificate. So this pretty much boils down to our previous uh, statement that sometimes some products, some even maybe analysts, can fall into the trap of believing that the sole presence of certificate is enough to conclude someone's legitimacy. Another example, um, actually in this case, what I wanted to, um, to indicate is that the world doesn't stop in, uh, in here, because even though, even when we steal the certificate, even if we apply it on the file, it doesn't ultimately mean that this file is going to be trusted by everybody out there. So this is me. Um, using the, the MSI signed Mimikatz, uploading it deliberately uh, to VirusTotal, and then seeing what's going to pop up. And as you can see, merely seven products were rolled out, which is, for me, to my taste, this is a terrific result, proving that products that most of the products are not so um, are not so believing um, the, the sole presence of certificates, even if they. If, if, even if they actually check out. And this was the time when the MSA certificate wasn't yet revoked, at least according to what I've been testing. So at that point of time, the certificate was still valid and was still intact. And even though the Microsoft was still considered as a, as a known threat, regardless of its certificate. So the outcome from, from this, a little bit of a detour for the blue teams and for the red teams. For the red teams, I think it is worth modeling the threat for integrating, incorporating the code signed payloads to, uh, to your Arsenal repertoire because, we want, um, because when you are dealing with a mature uh, environment, mature organization, and you already used most of the um, very well-known um, payloads, all the scripts, macros, uh, executable CPLs, XLLs were already tested at least at once, then when you are looking for, uh, for some somewhat newer, fresher uh, concepts, fresher vectors, then try um, integrating code leak, uh, leaked code signing certificates because threat actors already, already are in possession of those. You can already grab them publicly from the internet, which means that you are not so much far-fetching the rules of the engagement, 
because this certificate is already out there for anyone, for anyone to grab and, and to use. So you might try to sign your payloads and then see what the, um, what the, uh, what, uh, how blue teams and how the, uh, how the technical measures are going to react on them. Then from the blue teams, keep an eye on the, um, on the news coverage, on, on the rules that try to gather around uh, all the hashes or the fingerprints of such leaked certificates, and then, and then ensure that you have your hunting queries uh, implemented in place so that you'll be having the proactive protection against any resemblance of such a certificate in your organization. Now let's get back to the, uh, to the main core concept that we, that we, um, that we are, here, are here to discuss. The idea for complex slash desperate infection chains. So when thinking about chains, we can decompose the, a typical chain into subsequent steps. Among the others, we can have delivery. By delivery, we mean any means, any notion to deliver the file to the victim. This can be over the URL, this can be over some kind of an attachment, maybe a file attached to the LinkedIn post, LinkedIn message, um, maybe some kind of a MMS or text message. message. Then we've got container. Container is going to contain multiple files that are required for your infection to actually kick in. Um, golden were the times when it was enough to just send a single file, preferably macro-enabled office document, right? And then just one single file um, conveniently attached to the email was just enough to bridge the organization. I think that this, these days are kind of a diminishing and I kind of a gone away so this times these days probably we would want to try to adapt to whatever the actors are using currently which is bringing multiple files that constitute the infection bundled into a nice single container then the trigger now that you have all the files and now somewhat in some way the victim has already gotten access to these files uh, lying in the of the of the container how do you actually initiate the infection you're gonna need to have some kind of a trigger it can be a LNK, it can be a CHM. We'll be discussing this in shortly. Then, once, once you have this trigger, what is it that is going to be triggering, actually? You're going to need to have some kind of a payload. Multiple different ideas, such as, for instance, Microsoft signed executable, and then DLL side loading happening in the background. It can be one of the examples. Then, there's going to be decoy. Now that you lured your victim, in, victim into, into actually going all this way down to downloading the file, opening it, and then clicking something inside of it, you need to kind of a carry on with your narration. You need to um, convince the, the user that everything is going, is, is, is going just as expected. The victim is, for instance, installing the VPN update or so, and, this is a, and there is a, in some kind of an instruction for what to do next once the installation finishes. And let's just discuss one single example of such chain. Uh, we, can, we can leverage some spare phishing. Then we can convey the link in that mail. Then that link will be pointing towards HTML smuggling, because lately everyone is using HTML smuggling. Then the HTML smuggling is going to deliver the victim with the ISO. ISO is going to contain multiple hidden files and only one visible. Then one visible is going to be LNK, uh, pretending to be a nice PDF. And then, once the victim double clicks on it, that's gonna, that's gonna initiate the payload that you model it. That can be as simple as just running run DLL32, even though this looks really lameish, really straightforward, and really obnoxious, it is actually some, some technique used by the real world threat actors. This is an example of the Russian state actor that actually leveraged some, uh, this kind of a chains against the Polish, um, Polish officials and Polish military personnel. Here we can see that it all started with the phishing email linked to the compromised web server. This could be actually any kind of a cloud-hosted, cloud cloud-facing uh, cloud uh, web application that will be then dropping um, some kind of a container. Here we can see there are two flavors to that delivery, ISO and ZIP, and then depending on the, on the container, because there are, there, are uh, there are just nasty little distinctions, uh, differences between weaponizing ISO and ZIP, I'm gonna be uh, trying to talk about them in, in the next slide, then it's gonna be LNK, that will be either 
um, either running some for the run DLL, or there can be also the uh, executable that tried to pretend to be PDF by the ref to light override trick, which would then be importing legitimate DLL that was actually slightly modified by injecting another imported important func that will be then importing malicious 7z a DLL, actually delivering the payload. So let's now, uh, let us now discuss these chains um, in a nitty gritty. Let's start with, with delivery. Most of the, uh, the most commonly um, vector to deliver the files is going to be HTML smuggling because of its trait to fly past all the proxy, um, proxy stringent policy, file type policies. And this is because of the fact that the file gets embedded within the HTML code, meaning there is no, there's no clear way for the proxy to understand what is the effective intent of such a HTML file that the user just browsed into. Then, the, that such a HTML smuggling can, can, can implement multiple different uh, obfuscation ideas, uh, but ultimately there's going to be a dropper just simply delivering the file. Recently, Productive started also using so-called SVG smuggling. So the SVG file is actually an XML, um, XML structured um, image that can also contain script, JavaScript in this case, which means we can also use it for HTML smuggling, but just repurposed, just, um, just disguised as a SVG file. The downside or the protection coming from the, user, uh, from the internet browsers is that the file drop is going to be having GUI ID, meaning the attackers will be losing the file name over the drop file. There is no control over the file name. The only thing we can control is the extension. We can retain the extension as long as it's uh, among the benign um, whitelisted ones, such as zip, for instance, can be. So if you, go, if you want to go and drop the executable this way of the SVG, you're gonna, you're gonna see that the file is going to lose the extension, which is clearly uncool. Then other idea, recently, um, recently discussed by Mr. Docs, is going to be to create an, a website that is going to be um, mimicking pretty closely uh, the, the feel and, and the looks of a typical unarchiver, third-party unarchiver program, such as in this case, WinRAR. So we're gonna have only a, uh, we're gonna have a fake HTML just pretending to be, um, to be zip-based um, zip uh, client application. Then let's head for the container. ISO, IMG, they can contain hidden files. Zip also can contain hidden files. By just manipulating, by just adjusting um, file properties, file attributes within the zip structures, we can make some files hidden. Then there's also a lesser known a container called Windows Image, which is also, which is also having built-in support for the Windows system. We can weaponize it using, a, uh, using a, this nasty kind of a one-liner. And when we are referring to one-liners, every time blue teamers and threat hunters see one-liners, this is source for the entropy for your, uh, for your new, new hunting rules and your new Sigma rules, worth checking out, worth triaging in your, in your organization. And also, there is one nasty, tiny little thing worth notioning here. PowerShell's built-in expand archive does not propagate mark of the web, meaning if you have LNK and this LNK grabs, grabs a zip, that zip is going to have mark of the web, and you, and you, and you process that zip with expand archive to just decompress all the files, these files won't be having mark of the web uh, transferred onto them. Now, kind of a newish vector, when Microsoft announced to, um, to build in the support for 7-zip, RAR, and G-zip, right? And it shouldn't, it shouldn't take too much of a surprise to have to see the traductors already adapting and then conveying the G-zip-based or 7-zip-based maybe archives. So this kind of a adds, adds more options, more, um, more choices to our container stage. Now that we have container, clearly we need to, we need to execute some files that were contained within that container, right? So one of the most infamous examples is going to be LNK. LNK can, uh, can take many forms, many flavors. One, one of them, uh, some of them will be, will be just executing CMD, others will be executing PowerShell. The other one will be just running these CMDs and PowerShell over some kind of a low bin. So we can have LNK that runs conhost, conhost runs PowerShell. And now the question is, um, 
do our currently implemented threat hunting rules, maybe the rules trying to kind of a look around for the LNKs, are actually sensitive for having PowerShell run indirectly rather than directly from the Explorer? And the question is going to be um, left as is. Then, apart from LNK, we can have CHM, the very, well, the, the very old, clunky and ugly kind of a file format that is known and publicly documented for years already that can be used to execute some commands in the system upon double clicking. So it can basically run anything that is in there in your container, be it some kind of an executable payload that you, that, that you delivered. Then there can also be the click once application. Applic the click once comes bundled either in a one single file that can be dot application or appref ms. I'm going to be talking about this a little bit later on. Or this can be multiple files um, constituting the offline deployment scattered just locally inside of this container. And then this could be also repurposed as a trigger for our, our usage. Um, this is how the LNK is going to look like within the zip. As you can see, the LNK tends to lose its icon. Even though the icon is there, it just stops presenting. Uh, it, the Explorer, Explorer never presents one when, uh, when within the zip. And the LNKs can also um, incorporate multiple kind of a obs evasion or obscuring tricks to just, um, to just hide their intents, such as just padding the command line ar arguments with 500 spaces or so to kind of a overlap the, the text view control here in this Explorer properties view. Then the probably most interesting aspect of the chain is going to be payload. Um, there's no time to discuss m many more payloads, but you can already use your imagination that there is going to be probably ma many more options to, to choose from. Among the others, once you have your LNK or CHM, you, you, you might want to run exec Microsoft signed executable that is going to sideload the DLL. Both executable and DLL is going to be lo located and situated inside of the container. That's going to be effectively leading to, um, to running your malicious malicious code. Among, uh, apart from the executables, there can be also DLL, CPLs, XLL, even though Microsoft, Microsoft um, attempted to thwart the risk coming from the XLL by just enforcing that the XLL cannot have mark of the web flag in order to be loaded, there are still some tricks, such as expand archive, that could be used to, um, to strip the XLL off the mark of the web flag and then register, the, register it afterwards. It just boils down to kind of a hefty, long, longy uh, PowerShell command line to make it done. Then, XLAM. This is a terrific example where things could get really nasty really soon and get, it could get really stealthy. Just by copying and pasting the file around would be enough to, to, to constitute so-called phishing to persist, so delayed execution of the previously planted persistence. So by just simply pasting an Excel spreadsheet that is containing macros uh, coming in the extension of XLAM into the Excel start directory and then carrying on with, the, with, with opening the decoy document for the victim, that's going to be enough for that victim to, get, um, to execute that macro the next time it's going to run his Excel. Since the, macro, since the Excel start is among the trusted paths, and that's, that, that means that Excel is not going to be asking the victim for enabling macros because the macros, macros are already going to be trusted for running. So hence why the XLAM can be so devastating because it's going to be living, um, living um, below the radar somewhere, uh, somewhere um, deeply hidden in the system. Then the MSI access, APP access, we can even deploy the unsigned MSI access because of the fact that Microsoft recently introduced this idea for unsigned packages by just simply adding to the publisher so-called OID that is going to just follow the, follow the hard-coded value that Microsoft uh, documented, we can have MSIX that's going to be uh, unsigned and then, and then deploy it using this kind of a one-liner available in Windows 11. The, the crucial part is to allow unsigned, which is, which is a flag that, that, that wasn't, wasn't present in the Windows 10 fire call. Then the click once, it's, going, it's coming in at these three extensions, dot .application, dot .appref-ms, and vsto. It can also be um, abused to either install the click once located 
locally, offline, or just to deploy click counts that was published to the remote server by just indicating that, hey, there on this remote URL, that's going to be the click ones, pull all the files, install it right in the system. Then you can also think of multiple different ideas for bringing our own interpreter and script. Just imagine having a standalone auto hotkey or maybe auto it installer or maybe Perl coming just in a single file like standalone Perl interpreter and then just bring your own script. That's going to be enough to constitute yet another idea for a, for a payload. Once we have the payload, let's make the, let's make the victim happy and unaware that everything is going just as expected, just as planned, by presenting him with a decoy. That decoy is going to be just kind of a document that's gonna be, that's gonna be displayed right after deploying our malware. So from the, from the weaponization perspective, this can be as simple as just bringing this kind of a um, straightforward CMD piped right into the LNK. It's going to just run the, mal run the payload, pipe it, and then in the background just run yet another command. Just as simple. So, um, if you want to start from the Red Team perspective, naturally, if you want to start to play around this concept, or, you could, or, or would you like to, um, to model it, how would your defenses, how would your Sigma rules or other rules behave against such a, such a convoluted execution chains, you can start by just collecting the files around in a single directory, and then bringing yourself, uh, crafting your own LNK or CHM, then just packing them all together into a nice and shiny zip or, I, or, or, or ISO. You can use also the hide flag coming with pack my payload that is going to just help you, help you hide the files inside of it, and then deliver it over the HTML smuggling. Also, one of the tricks that Halfrick used to use, the Russian state actor, is just to append a nasty, nasty, keep loads of spaces to just kind of a visually hide the extension. Okay, um, I think that's gonna be um, the last, uh, last point in my agenda, the unusual vectors, just a two tiny little concepts here. We know we can have DLL side loading against native, native unmanaged executables, right? Just bringing, um, for instance, teams um, teams.exe, and then just planting the version .dll just side by side to it, uh, ensuring that the Teams is going to load the version .dll once it executes itself. But there is, there is just yet another reincarnation of the same idea, but in the .NET managed world. And it's called Abdomain Manager. The idea behind Abdomain Manager is to, is to have our own, well, Abdomain Manager implemented in a DLL and then yet another file called, uh, called in this case, config, that is going to just, um, to just instrument the CLR runtime, the .NET runtime, uh, pointing that, hey, if you want to go around instantiating up domain, here is my custom manager that's going to help you out in this, in this endeavor. So, how can we actually weaponize it? We're gonna have a, a, a .NET process, and there are actually, there are, there are actually specific, Prerequisites, uh, prerequisites and, and requirements that the that the dotnet executable must um, uh, must must follow in order to have this this um, this vector weaponized. So not all the dotnet executables are going to be prone to this attack. In this case, we we have we can see add in process. Then uh, we're gonna we're gonna have the config file. So coming with the extension, coming with the file name and extension of the of the original susceptible executable, followed by config. And it's going to be containing such a small, um, small contents. Firstly, we're going to be indicating that all the dependencies you need are going to be located in the same directory. Then this is the um, this is the reference line for the .NET assembly that's going to to um, to implement um, the class, the factory uh, that we refer to in the next in the next node, abdomen manager type. This is the name of the class. So it can be as simple as this one, just by overriding initialize new domain we can execute our nasty, um, nasty intents in there. So this is yet another thing to, um, to, to look for, the presence of .config files, especially in, um, in containers, especially in the lesser known ones, uh, lesser trusted ones. Um, and then one last, one last vector 
probably worth bringing up here, the click ones. This is actually quite an old idea to run, um, to run untrusted code in the system. It's been already discussed several times by several, uh, by, by several researchers, but I think in the light of ever-increasing complexity for bringing our code uh, into the organization, we as a red teamers, as well as um, the threat actors that, that tend, to, tend to think this in the same way, we tend to undust the previously discussed code execution primitives, then reinvent the wheel, and then reuse them um, to just accommodate to the ever-changing landscape of what is still possible, what is still viable. So hence why we are undusting um, the old click once idea. So to have a nice click once yourself, you can just create your own executable or preferably .NET managed executable. It doesn't need to follow any, any specific rules, specific prerequisites. It's just a straightforward vanilla hello world kind of an executable. Then once being inside of the directory of your compiled executable, you just need to use Microsoft signed um, tool that is just going to help you in the process for generating all the manifest XMLs. So there's going to be mage, which is going to create you dot, this dot .exe manifest, followed by, you might also want to sign it. If you don't sign your manifest, you click once, it is still going to, to deploy the malware, it's still going to execute itself, but this is going to make smart screen so unhappy about it. So in order to circumvent the smart, the smart screen, we probably would need to have a code signing certificate, or at least try to, um, try to um, kind of a strip it off the mark of the web flag, or just try to load it, execute it in another context that wouldn't be so much scrutinized by the smart screen in the first place. Then, once you have the .exe manifest, you can sign the manifest that you just created, then you're gonna deploy, then you're gonna generate your application file. And this is actually this double clickable vector that is going to, uh, to, uh, to initiate the entire click once deployment. So this is what, is, uh, what the threat actors might be wanting to, to lure their victim into clicking, that dot application file. Then .NET, that click once can be, can be deployed in two forms, the online only and the offline or online. The install, install equals true or install equals false. The former is going to, um, is going to save multiple different files are around the file system. So there's going to be pl plenty of traces, plenty of leftovers after such a de deployment, whereas the offline one, the install equals false, is going to only um, manipulate with, with one temporary cache, cache directory. Um, and then, finally, once you have your click once, you can deliver it by either pointing the victim to the application file, or you can also point um, you can also deliver or just point the victim into the appprf-ms file, which is going to indicate that, hey, there is a click once deployment and it's going to be available at this URL. You can test it out. It just runs calc, I promise. So if you want to try it out yourself, you can, you can use the URL. And then once the victim double clicks on the file, there's going to be click once deployment initiating in the background. So just one, one probably forgotten file that is still worth smuggling in the attachment or just linking directly in your phishing email. Then also, from the perspective of your trigger, your LNK or CHM, you can also um, use the very well-known well, well friend, the run DLL, to just um, run the deployment yourself manually, either from the locally, uh, locally available path or from the URL. Also, finally, one last tiny, um, tiny dime worth adding here. There is a terrific, terrific explanation and work through by Nick Powers and Steven Flores when, uh, when they discuss how we can even find legitimate, trusted, signed click once deployments, so on the third party ones, and how we could backdoor it to sideload our malicious, malicious code by, by leaving off somebody else's signature instead of reinventing and bringing our own one. So, that will be pretty much all to it. Let us just sum up what we have so far. Firstly, first of all, um, the landscape of initial access is really rapidly changing. We can see literally, um, we can see vendors applying their own mitigations and countermeasures um, literally every month. And this means that the number of possible vectors 
file formats and extensions is just is just rapidly diminishing. The number of choices that the that the attackers that the threat actors are having, also the quality, the effectiveness of the rules, the the crowdfunded rules that are being shared among the threat hunters and the blue teamers, are just are just getting so much better and just are are just getting so much more effective at finding and hunting for these vectors that it feels like, from the offensive perspective, it feels like. Uh, the battle is just slipping away from uh, slipping out of our fingers, which means that the, the bar for the threat access was also rise increasingly, which is naturally good for the effective outcome for advancing the, the industry's resilience against commodity threats. So, for, from the perspective of of another vectors, we also believe that currently the the, the side loading idea to just lift off somebody else's signature, so to perhaps inject your shellcode into the certificate area within the executable, then bring your own malicious DLL that would, that would, that would get sideloaded and then fetch payload from that certificate area by abusing the DLL sideloading is a wonderful way uh, to proceed now in these days. However, we think, we believe, that probably Microsoft is going to kill that, kill that bit pretty soon as well. But then the question is going to be, how much of an inertia is going to take for other vendors to adapt and then to accommodate to that, um, that enforcement for loading only signed the DLLs. For the recommendations, I think that I would say CA gems, um, MSIs, MSI access click ones, complex chains are kind of a way to, to proceed now. I would hold on on the LNKs because the vendors are getting so much better and hunting and dissecting those. CPLs and XLLs, there are also kind of a triggering, triggering uh, alarms like a Christmas tree. And then I would probably just move away from Office Macros because of the fact how much, how much effective Mark of the Web enforcement was actually. And in this, um, and this way, I would like to thank you very much, guys, for your time and attention. <laughs> <laughs>